Dr. Pally has three kids and three grandkids. So she has three grown children and three grandkids. She was in private practice as a psychiatrist, therapist, and psychoanalyst for 40 years and has worked with lots of parents. She's written three books. Two of them were for therapists. The most recent book, which we have copies of, which you can buy today if you'd like to have one to read, I have one at my nightstand, is The Reflective Parent, How to Do Less and Relate More with Your Kids. So that book is for you. We have it here. In 2008, she founded a nonprofit organization, the Center for Reflective Communities, that works with parents and all of those involved in the care of children. While she recently retired from her private practice, she still works a lot with her nonprofit organization, writing and talking about parenting. And some of you who have kids at Milken know that she works with a lot of our parents over at Milken as well. It is with great pleasure and an honor that I introduce to you Regina Pally. Regina, welcome to the lovely introduction and really thank you so much for the opportunity to get to talk to you and to talk to you about my book. Um, so parents are always wanting to know what do I do and listen we all want to know what to do and my book is a little different than other books it's not going to tell you what to do but it's going to tell you how to think about what you're doing and how to do it. And while that may not satisfy your craving for somebody to tell you what the answer is and what to do, you can read my book because I give lots and lots of suggestions in my book. And as I talk, I will in fact give some suggestions. But mostly, what reflective parenting is, is it's a mindset. It's like what my yoga instructor says. It's not what you do, it's how you do what you do. So, I know that all of you parents you want to be the best parent you can be. But let's face it, it's not so easy to figure out what that is. And so if you're like me, or like every other parent I ever talked to, you go online, you look for what the experts have to say. You read books, you come to lectures, you want to know what the experts have to say. And trust me, there's a lot of great information. I know a lot of people will tell you don't look on the internet. I don't agree with that. I think it's fine to look on the internet. What you have to remember, though, is you are the expert on your child. And so you have to have the ability to read all the information and then to filter it through what makes most sense to you as to who your child is, as to who you are as a pe person and as a parent, and who your family is, what your family circumstances are. Because what the experts have to say doesn't always apply to everyone. So, really, that's why I wrote this book. I wrote this book because this is the book I needed when I was raising my kids. And it didn't exist when I was raising my kids, and it still doesn't exist, I think. And so, I had to write it. Okay, so, um, as Tammy said, um, I started a nonprofit organization. And I started this nonprofit organization because I thought this concept of reflective parenting was so critical and so important. I wanted everyone to be able uh, to get a chance to experience it. Okay, thank you. And um, so our nonprofit started as a way to promote healthy child development by strengthening the parent-child relationship and the relationship that children have with all the people involved in their care. And as a nonprofit, we bring this mostly to parents and children most in need. And so we work directly with community agencies serving poor, low-income, and disadvantaged families. But since it's such a great idea, um, I knew that more middle-class and affluent families would, would want to know about this. And so one of the first people I spoke with was Matuka Benjamin, no less. And um, she was so excited about what we do that she helped us facilitate bringing reflective parenting to Milken School and we trained them, and now they run it themselves, and it's embedded into the program. And we also have brought our programs to um, other private schools, like Wildwood, for example, some preschools. So if any of you are interested in bringing reflective parenting here, uh, you can talk to me after the, my presentation. Oop. 
So here's the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about why I wrote the book, why the parent-child relationship matters most, what reflective parenting is and why it's important, and the reflective parenting toolkit and examples about how to apply reflective parenting and the conclusion and take-home lessons. And um, I'd like to remind you that the parent, here we are in a school, children are just about to start their first day of school, and I want to remind you and emphasize that it is the parent-child relationship that is the most important classroom for learning. The human brain, the human child brain in particular, is designed to learn best from within our social relationships. And um, actually, I think I just sent Tammy an article about how science is learning this more and more. Which might distribute it for everybody if they're interested. So this is why I wrote the book. Parents are under a lot of stress. And sure, there's a lot of stress that comes from financial problems, illness in the family, family discord, divorce, even you know, worries about climate change and terrorism, right? But that's not the stress that I'm talking about in my book. The stress I'm talking about is the stress we put on ourselves, the internal stresses. So what are some of those internal stresses? There's a right way to parent, and I have to figure out what it is. I have to be a perfect parent. I have to do everything for my child. Otherwise, I'm going to fail them and miss out. There's a right answer to my question. There's a right solution to every problem. I'm telling you, parents will really press me and say, tell me what to do. I know there's a, a right way to do this. And I'll say, well, no, you know, it could be this, it could be that. And they go, no, you're the expert. You know what the right answer is. And I always say, the right answer is many different answers. There's always more than one way to think about a situation. So this is a mindset. It incorporates a lot of ideas that I'm going to be talking about um, throughout my talk today. The dilemma is, when you put those internal pressures on yourself about having to be perfect, or having to do it absolutely right, or talk exactly the right way, or be 100% consistent, all those pressures we put on ourselves, makes you more stressed. And the more stressed you are, the more you pass on stress to your child, and the less able you are to understand what's going on with your child. This is why we have to avoid stress. Okay. Ah, okay. So let me talk about why relationships matter so much. I emphasize over and over again, when in doubt, pay attention to the relationship. When in doubt, put the parent-child relationship front and center. Okay. You need to spend more time thinking about your relationship with your child and having a relationship with your child than on focusing so much on all the things you have to do. That's one of the keys. Why is this? Well, first of all, I said already that Parent-child relationship is the key classroom in which your child is going to learn everything important they need to know about life. The second reason is that we know from studies over and over and over again, research studies that show, when children have a strong parent-child relationship, they're just much more likely to do well in life. And they do well in life in all the areas you care about. Like they do better in school. They also do better getting along with other people. They're more cooperative. They are more likely to be able to be self-regulated. And they're even more likely to grow up and be successful or reach their full potential. Now, I'd like to just take a little uh, Instagram Snapchat moment here. Remember about, I don't know, it was about 15 minutes ago, Tammy was trying to get all of you to come from the back, you're all chattering away, and um, you know, come and sit down. You know how long it took her? 10 minutes. You were not listening to her. I want you to remember that the next time your child doesn't listen to you. Okay, why was that? Now, as I said to Tammy, she and I were chatting about this, because I noticed it right away. And I said to her, Just having a hard time stopping what they're doing to 
good time at what they're doing, right? They're not doing it to you. They're doing it because they're just, Tammy was great. She said, well, I'm glad. It means that we have a good community. Everybody's, you know, really happy to see each other. This is what's going on with your kids. 99% of that behavior that you've labeled bad, it's just what's going on inside of them. It's not at you, about you, or to you. If you take nothing else home from this talk today, remember that. Okay, I'm going to remind you again about it. Anyway. Okay, so the, the reason I, we call our organization Reflective Communities, the reason I call my book The Reflective Parent, is because there's this capacity we have, this mental capacity we have called reflective capacity. It goes by a lot of different names. Some people call it reflective thinking, reflective function, a rose by any other name, you know. It, they all mean the same thing. Some people, scientists actually even call it mentalization. But, you know, that's too mental for me. So I like to, I think reflective thinking is more user friendly. Now what it means, I'll talk about what it means to be reflective. But basically, being reflective is the way that we understand other people and the way that we can see our child's perspective as well as our own. Being reflective is the key ingredient for a strong parent-child relationship. So if a strong parent-child relationship is going to help your child do better in life, being reflective is the first ingredient in, in uh, having that strong relationship. And I'm going to talk about what it's going to require of you to do that. Okay. Another reason that the parent-child relationship is so important. And, I, and I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. The parent-child relationship, blah, 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 again and again, is from an evolutionary point of view, we know that humans are the most social creatures on Earth, and that all human survival depends on our social relationships. I couldn't have given this talk without my dependency on the social relationship I have with Tammy, for example or even the person who helped me with my clicker. So one of your roles as a parent is to help your child become a competent social person. We don't usually think about it this way. We think our role is to get them to brush their teeth, to take a bath, and uh, you know, join the soccer team, or get it, you know, do well on, on their homework. It turns out that everything you teach your child Within the parent-child relationship, everything you teach your child about how to be a social person, primarily with you, but also with the other people they encounter, everything you teach them actually is the exact lesson they need to know for how to do well in school, for how to uh, persevere when things get tough. So what am I talking about? Well, within that relationship, Right? Don't, isn't one of the most important things you teach your child is you have to wait, right? Or you have to take turns, or you can't interrupt, or you know, all those things. You have to cooperate. Those are the things we're building what scientists call our executive functions. This is the self-control function. This is the inhibitory function. So all those little lessons you're te teaching your child about no, you already had ice cream, you can't have ice cream again, um, are teaching your child how to self-control. And this is the key ingredient for being able to pay focused attention in class. This is the key ingredient for being able to keep doing your math problems even though they get difficult. So parents often worry about, like, oh, if we're spending so much time talking about the relationship, being in the relationship, my kid's not going to do well in school. Uh-uh. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Okay, so I keep talking and harping about what a strong parent-child relationship is, and I like to think of it, the image I have is of a strong rubber band that you can pull apart, but it keeps coming back together again, doesn't snap. What we know, this is all from science, but I'll tell it to you in most simple terms, what we know that scientists consider a strong parent-child relationship, sometimes they call it a secure attachment, you may have, some of you may have heard that term, is a strong relationship with a parent and child is one in which the parent encourages and promotes closeness and dependency. Children are 
very dependent on their parents. And parents allow for that, right, and respond to it. But it's also a relationship that encourages separateness and independence, and it has both. So your child's gonna be connected with you at times, but sometimes they're gonna be their own separate person. They're gonna think their own way, do it their own way. Actually, it's interesting, I was just um, talking to some people from China who've come, who moved to the United States. You know why they moved to the United States? Their parents. And in China, children are not allowed to think for themselves. Now, they were really, really like astounded about this whole concept that here, we encourage our children to think for ourselves. But it's a balancing act, remember? Because sometimes being close with your child means you're gonna be sharing your point of view with them, what you want them to think. So it's this, it's this constant balancing act but allowing them to have their own mind as well. Okay. The other thing I like to uh, think of is it's also a balancing act, again, between being comforting and soothing and empathic and validating and all that lovely stuff, with also setting limits and establishing boundaries and expectations. Everything in parenting is a balancing act. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And every parent-child relationship is going to have a little different balance on that scale. Now, I always remind people that having a strong relationship is not a perfect relationship. I like to say, striving for perfection is the path to failure. People who try too hard to be perfect don't do well in life. So, the, and this should reassure you, the strong parent-child relationship means sometimes your child's going to feel good and sometimes they're going to feel bad. Sometimes you and your child are going to be really in sync and clicking and going smoothly, and sometimes you and your child are going to be so out of sync, not getting along. Sometimes your child, you can really understand your child, and sometimes you can really misunderstand your child. And again, it's this balance. It's avoiding the extremes of always misunderstanding or even always understanding. And I'm going to explain that a little bit. Okay, so now finally I'm going to explain what does it mean to be reflective. Okay, um, being reflective sounds very scientific, but it's really this quite ordinary mental skill that we have, right? Um, we have a lot of mental skills, very clever human beings, a lot of mental skills, and one of them is this capacity to be reflective. It's kind of like a perceptual system of the mind. We have a lot of perceptual systems. We have our eyes for seeing objects. We have our ears for hearing noises. We have skin receptors that allow us to touch things. We have smell receptors. We also have this perceptual ability to understand the minds of other people, and our own mind as well. Um, no other animal has a mind, so no other animal needed this perceptual ability. But we have cir new circuitry in the human brain it has given us this perceptual ability. It's almost a little bit like mind reading, but not. But it allows us to make sense of what's going on inside the mind, which is hidden and out of view. Okay, so this is how it works. Being reflective is defined as the ability to realize everyone has a mind, just like you. And that everybody's mind is separate, and therefore everybody can have a different perspective on the world that all people's behavior is linked to something going on inside their mind. So what you see on the outside is the action. But the, the reason for that action is something going on inside the mind. What goes on inside the mind? Thoughts, feelings, beliefs, goals, intentions. Your intention, when you weren't listening to Tammy, your intention was to, you were all chatting away, and your intention was to stay connected with each other. That's what I mean. That's, that's going on inside the mind. Now, the idea is, is that being reflective, actually, we know that when adults are reflective, they tend to be more successful in life. They're more well-adjusted, they get along better with people, and they actually are more successful. Now, that's adults. But children aren't born with the capacity to be reflective. 
They have to learn it from their parents. They have to learn it from people who are reflecting with them. It's like language. All children are born with the potential to learn how to speak, but they have to be spoken to right, in order to learn um, how to talk. So we have to reflect with children in order to pass on this reflective ability. Children literally internalize the relationship they have with us. They internalize it into themselves. And the relationship you have with your child becomes the relationship your child will have with themselves. The way you encourage your child becomes the way your child will encourage themselves. The way you soothe your child will become the way your child soothes themselves. And the way you criticize and judge your child will also become the way they will criticize and judge themselves. And this is another reason why the relationship is so important. Okay, so when, as a parent, all you have to do is think about, notice your child's behavior, and think about the reason why they're behaving that way. And that's how we do this automatically. It's the same, though, for you. What you're doing is connected to what's going on inside of you. And that's what makes parenting hard. It's not the kids, I have to say. It's us. Ah, okay. So we have this natural capacity to be reflective. It's in, it built into the system, and whenever we see someone act, we automatically make an assessment or an inference or an assumption about the reason why they're acting that way. And then we respond to our assumption about why they're acting that way, and that's what we actually respond to, okay? So it doesn't really matter what someone tell, says to you, right? What you respond to is not their words. You respond to what you assume their intention is as to why they're saying it to you. So for example, you can say something as seemingly benign as, hi, how are you today? And if that person's in a particularly sensitive or suspicious mood, they may think your intention is to somehow, you know, cause them embarrassment or, uh, or comment on what they look like or something. They can, they can imbue you with having a, some negative, intention toward them, and that's what we're going to be responding to. Nice dress, right? Depends on how you interpret it. We respond to our interpretation about what, the reason why someone is behaving the way they are. Now, the dilemma is that this is all going on outside our conscious awareness, right? 99% of what the brain is doing, maybe 99.9% .9 of what the brain is doing and how we're functioning occurs on autopilot. It's, it's kind of sad to think about it, but that's just how it is. And so reflective function, reflective capacity, does this automatic thing about making assumptions about why your child is acting the way they are. And we do it automatically without conscious awareness and we're responding to our assumption about why they're doing what they're doing, but we're blind to our own process. So if we get it wrong, we don't know. Okay. This is the automatic way it happens. So you see your child behave and you respond more to your assumption about why they're behaving than to actually what's going on with them. And because their behavior is bound to activate some kind of emotion in you, we respond more to our own emotion than we do to what's going on inside our children. I apologize for the brain. This is just how it works, okay? But there's something we can do about it. We're very lucky because nature also endowed us with this ability to be reflective in a conscious way. And so, who's, is anybody played sports here? Okay. Whether you play tennis or golf or, or even if you to do photography, whatever it is, you have a skill. And once you do it, you can kind of do it pretty automatically. But if you have to alter your skill, maybe to improve it or change something you're not doing quite right, you have to actually slow down and think about what you're doing. So you can change your automatic processes. Same thing with reflective function. So this is what we always are encouraging parents to do. That this automatic reflectivity, it works pretty well most of the, a lot of the time. As long as things are going smoothly, you don't have to think about being reflective because you just are reflective. Doing it naturally. You're automatically making an assumption about why your child's doing the way what they're doing. They're going like this. And you, you automatically know they're tired. 
right? Or maybe they have an allergy or something, but you kind of have an automatic sense of it. And you, things go smoothly. It's when things aren't going smoothly. Anybody can parent when things are going smoothly. I'm a genius at parenting when things are going smoothly. It's when things are not going smoothly. That's when you need to slow down, be in the present moment, and think about what's going on with my child. And because what's going on with your child is hidden from view, it's inside your mind, you may be right, you may be wrong. And in fact, there could be many different things. This is a big thing we emphasize. Don't get hung up on being rigid and thinking, I don't know why they're behaving that way. Because it might be something else. You have to be really open-minded to the, come up here. Shirley, thank you for being willing to volunteer. And I'm going to illustrate for you that you are already reflective. Because okay, a lot of times when I tell parents you have to be reflective, their eyes glaze over and they think, I don't have time to be reflective. Right? I'm never going to remember to be reflective. I can't even remember where my keys are. That's what I'm trying to remember being reflective. So I'm going to show you that you all already are reflective. Okay? Here's the illustration. Okay. So would anybody like to tell me what I'm doing? Thank you. That's very good. Anybody want to tell me what I'm doing? Offering an apple. Offering to share. Anything else? Showing her the apple. Okay, great. You all get an A+. Plus. You've all been reflective. Not a single person here mentioned what my action was. Nobody said, you're holding up your arm and there's an apple sitting on your hand, right? Nobody, nobody focused on the action. Everyone jumped to my intention about the reason why I'm behaving the way I do. And even Shirley, she reached out for it. She thought I was going to give it to her, right? Or share it. Or play catch, right? Exactly. The same action. I could have been showing it to her because I'm showing off. I have a nice apple and you don't. Or, or anything. Or isn't it a beautiful apple? Right? So the whole concept is this is what we are always doing as parents. We're jumping to a conclusion about why our children are behaving the way we are, they are. And this is just how the brain works, I'm sorry to tell you again, is as soon as we come up with a perception about an assumption about why we think they're behaving that way, this is just how our mind works. We assume we are right, and it's the only way to look at it. Once we have a perception about something, we're pretty darn sure we are right about it. It's the only way to look at the situation. Thank you, Shirley. Okay. So, and a lot of times we are right, but we're not always right, just as in this case. Right? And actually, I'll tell you, you know what my intention was? Does anyone want to know my real intention? My real intention was to demonstrate what being reflective is about. That was actually my intention. I, wasn't, I didn't have any of those other intentions in mind. Okay. So, here's a, here's a good picture for illustrating, again, how reflective you already are. So does anybody want to tell me what the little girl is doing? It's not a trick question. Come on. She's trying to share the ice cream. She wants him to share the ice cream with her. Anybody else? Yeah, so now, now you're getting really clever. This woman said, you're op she's opening her mouth. That's the action. But it's not going to... You don't know how to respond to she's opening her mouth, right? That's not what we respond to. She wants a kiss. <laughs> she wants to kiss the ice cream. So I'll tell you, this girl's mother thought she was being greedy and said to her, you've already had your own ice cream. Don't try to take more of his, right? Some other mother, you know, might have responded in a different way. Because actually, the little boy was very happy. It turns out he was very happy to share his ice cream with her. Okay, so here's another one. I know you've all been the recipient of this, one way or another. Um, this girl's actions are she's rolling her eyes up and she's folding her arms and saying, whatever, right? Uh, or mom, or something like that, right? And so, again, here we are, we are automatically going to jump to a conclusion about why she's doing that. She doesn't respect us, she doesn't care about us, she's uh, rejecting us. And it may just be she's impatient. She may be feeling impatient, but it may not even be 
about us that much. Or sometimes it is, but we still have to not take it personally. Okay, so you don't have to like read all the details on this slide because I was nice enough to print it out for you, and so you all have a, a copy of this, as well as that little, um, what we call the uh, think, feel, thinking, feeling, doing uh, bubble, thought bubble thing, so you can take that home with you. So on the left is the skill of being reflective, this mental skill and all the tools, and I've already spoken about what that is. It's about seeing the behavior, realizing the behavior is linked to the mind, and trying to figure out what's going on in the mind, but being open to the idea that there's more than one possibility. And then I have a list of 10 guiding principles that help you keep your reflective functioning operating well. Because reflective capacity is actually a mental skill, and like math or any other skill we have, um, we, we can do it better or worse. And it actually is something that can be measured, and I'd like to reassure people, it's measured on a 10-point scale, and you only have to be average. You only have to be a five or a six. But even the most reflective of us, and I'm a very reflective person, when we're under stress, reflective function goes out the window, because when we're under stress, we're operating in the now moment of danger and, you know, and we're not like going into deep thinking. So even the best of us, when we're under stress, our reflective capacity can go back down to a three. Right? Not going to be understanding our child very well, we're not going to be understanding ourselves very well. Okay. So now I'm going to... Okay. There's another take-home lesson. This is a quote from James Baldwin. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. Children are copycats. Their brains are different than adult brains, and their brains are wired to imitate everything that people do. Wait, wait, take your picture after, yeah, that's the, that's the cute part. Okay, so, we have specialized areas of our brain, imitate what other people do, but as adults, we're mature enough, we don't always copy what everybody's doing, hopefully. But children's brains are different, and they are copying everything you do. And so they are copying how you act, how you relate, even how you relate to them. Okay? That's what they're learning. How you're doing it, what you're doing, not so much your words. So be a good role model. Treat your child the way you would think you would want to be treated. Okay. Treat your child the way Tammy did. Make a positive assumption about their intentions rather than a negative one. Okay, so parents often ask me, uh, I have to be so understanding, everybody's telling me I have to be so understanding, empathic, validating. How am I going to get my child to do what I want them to do? Well, the point of being a parent, actually, is to be in charge. You are in charge. Your child wants you to be in charge. Your child needs you to be in charge. And so parenting really requires two arms. One arm is for holding the feelings, the emotions, the caring and nurturing and emotionally responsive. And one arm is for holding the line. One arm is for setting expectations, limits, and boundaries. But, again, it's how you set those limits and boundaries. And if you are reflective, and you have the capacity to really understand where your child's coming from and what it is they really need, you are going to be able to set those boundaries and limits in a more respectful, firm, and not harsh and aggressive way. And that's what's important. Kids need limits. Can I say that again? Kids need limits. Now, what limit do they need? It depends. The limits we set on our children, this is, I think, the hardest thing for parents to accept, the limits we set on our children. Tammy can't tell you what limit to set. I can't tell you what limit to set. The limits are your limits. And this is what makes parenting hard. We don't, we don't want to disappoint our kids or upset them. 
And so we often are fuzzy about the limits we set. No, you can't have a second ice cream. That's your limit. Except if you feel guilty. Or if you accept if you realize, oh, it's their birthday, or it's their, whatever. You know, we get wishy washy about our limits. And so the limits are your limits. I never mind being woken up early in the morning because I'm an early riser. For some other parent, they are very clear. You cannot come into my room until 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm setting the clock, and you're going to see that you can't come in until, you know, they're very rigid about it. I'm not like that. Some other parent is rigid about something else. But our limits are our limits. We have to be honest with ourselves what our limits are. Okay. Again, I'd like to say that you're in charge. Your child's brain is wired to once they have that, you know, like, you know, you make that early attachment relationship with them. What that attachment relationship does, it assigns you as the trusted guide. You are the person they are looking to for all the information they need about how to function in the world. As parents, we forget this a lot of time. We get just these helpless states of like, I can't get my child to do what they, I want them to do. I can't, whatever. We forget that our children are really need us to guide them. But he's protesting and crying. He won't do what I want him to do. No. Part of protesting and crying is to be looking to you and see how are you going to respond to this? How are you going to deal with it? Do I have to do it or don't I have to do it? And this is where it becomes really hard to parent because we have to trust ourselves. We have to trust our own answers. And sometimes we don't know what the answer is. Well, that's an important thing to share. I don't know what to do. You know, we're at, a, we're at a junction in the road and the guide says, I'm not sure which way to go, right? You don't want a guy who artificially says, this is the right way to go. You know, you want them to be honest. I don't know which way to go. You are your child's guide. And even when they're protesting and they're angry and they're refusing to do what you want them to do, you have to share what it is you believe is the best way for them to handle it. So how do they, what, what are they looking for? They look for your social and emotional cues, your facial expression, your tone of voice, your body posture, your chatting away, but it's really the social and emotional cues behind what you're saying that is what their child, your child is looking for. Okay, so I emphasize a lot this idea of two-way perspective taking. Understanding your child has a separate mind with a separate perspective, and you can make a guess as to what's going on inside of them, but you may be right or you may be wrong. And so here's an example. This is uh, Tina and her mom, Caroline. And, Tina, and Caroline, the mom, is feeling very virtuous. She's sitting there and patiently helping her daughter, Tina, with her horribly difficult math assignment. And Tina is just getting angry and annoyed at her. And at one point, Tina says to her, Mom, stop it. You're being a pest. You don't know what you're talking about. We're a little, you know, a few curse words in there, maybe. And Caroline now feels really hurt, really unappreciated. And so she's going to be responding to her daughter from that perspective, her own feelings of hurt and rejection. And so she says in a really angry tone of voice, don't get so angry with me. I'm just trying to help. If you keep yelling at me like that, I'm not going to help you anymore. And her daughter, in complete surprise, looks at her mom and says, Mom, I'm not angry with you. I'm just angry. I'm angry that the math is so hard and that I can't do it. And her mom goes, ah, oh, of course. I'm taking it personally. And because the mom is reflective, mom, she's able to shift and go, OK, my bad. I shouldn't take it so personally. I'm sorry. I'll try it. OK, so here's a situation where a little two and a half year old Liam gets in the cradle of his eight-month-old baby sister. No, actually, I think she probably looks more like maybe four or five months old. And he gets in there, and his mom, Suzanne, gets very anxious because her assumption is that he wants to hurt her, wants to hit the baby. So she's all anxious, and she grabs him, and she lifts him, takes him roughly out of the cradle, puts him on the ground, and he starts to cry, and she says, stop your crying, shouldn't be in the cradle, 
And then he throws a toy, because he's upset, and then she yells at him for that, and anyhow, they're off and running, right? And so she comes to me, and she knows that she didn't handle it so well, and she says, you know, what should I have done? And I said, well, let's sit down and think about what are some of the possibilities of why he was in the cradle? What are, could be some other possibilities besides trying to hurt her. And she says, Maybe he wants more attention. Or, oh, maybe he just wants to be a baby himself. Well, fortunately, Liam is like most kids. It's like most kids, he does it again, right? So he gets in the cradle the next time, and the next time she says, oh, little Liam, she takes him out gently, you just want to be a little baby. And he goes, ooh, ooh, ga, ga, and you know, she soothes him and comforts him. And then he gets up and goes, jumps out of her arms and says, I'm a big boy now. She was responsive to his little baby need, and he could move past it. She had to be open-minded and flexible. Okay, now you can go to the next slide. Okay, so what if you have two parents? Well, two parents have two separate minds. In fact, you know, grandparents have another set of another mind, and you know, your, your best friend has a different mind. Anyhow, so two parents. Here's a situation where you have to understand that your spouse or your husband or your ex or whoever it is has a different mindset than you. And I, I like to think about this as an example I emphasize a lot, that it's important to be more positive than negative with our children. I mean, sure, we can always look at the negative, right? I mean, our, actually our brains are a little bit designed to look at the negative, but we have to resist that urge and try to focus more on the positive, because again, research, you know, studies of kids over the years, when parents are more positive and less negative, more understanding, more comforting than, than harsh and aggressive, we know kids do better. And it helps when you see things in a positive light. So in uh, this case, um, Ben and Shira, the parents, um, had a little daughter, Sarah, and she was very shy. She always had a hard time making friends, particularly a best friend. And so she's in fourth grade, I think, and the teacher's really excited because Sarah made a best friend, Rona, another little shy girl in class. And the teacher's really excited to tell the parents because she thinks they're going to be really happy. And she tells the parents, and in fact, the mom is happy. She says, I'm so glad my daughter finally has a best friend. Well, that's very sweet, right? But the father, he's disappointed. The teacher's a little taken aback. The father's disappointed. But he's well-intentioned, too. His disappointment comes from the fact that he says, I wish my daughter hadn't made a best friend with the other shyest girl in the class. Because he had hoped that she'd make friends with a more popular girl, perhaps. Maybe it would have been more helpful for her. Anyhow, we kind of helped the father be more reflective about the situation and see that it was really more positive for his daughter. So this one is, give your child room to have their feelings. Why? Well, when children are having strong feelings, it's really hard on us. When our kids are crying, and they're sad, or they're angry, or disappointed, it's hard on us. And a lot of times our instinct is to tell them to stop feeling that way. Stop crying, or we'll try and do anything to get them to stop crying or being disappointed. But we have to give our kids room for their feelings. And the reason being is that if you're having overly intense feelings, you cannot regulate your feeling unless you know what you're feeling. And we're really teaching our child to learn how to regulate their own feeling rather than always be dependent on us. So we have to get our kids to be able to have their feelings and label them. The first step in regulating an intense feeling is to label and name the feeling. I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm disappointed, whatever that is. But you have to have room to have your feelings in order to do that. And we have to learn how to survive our feelings. We're allowed to have feelings. We're going to have bad feelings. Because if you teach your child they have to make all bad feelings go away, you know what that does? It leaves them more prone to doing negative things later on in life to make their bad feelings go away. Like drinking, taking drugs. You want them to feel they can survive their feelings. Okay, take home lesson. Don't try to fix everything. We want to build resilience in our children. Resilience is the capacity to bounce back after something negative happens. How is your child going to bounce back if you fix everything? 
Your child is going to have to always stay at home, live with you, because you're the fixer. We need to teach our children that they have the capacity in themselves to fix things for themselves. It builds up a child's sense of self-esteem, self-worth, competence, and well-being. For them to have that inner experience, they can actually come up with their own solutions and ideas about how to deal with things. And you rob them of that ability if you fix everything too quickly. And I know you don't want to do that. Your urge is to fix because you care about your child and it's so hard for you to watch them have trouble. But trust me, try to remember, it's a gift to your child for you to step back and give them some opportunity. And you can help them figure it out, but just don't fix it for them. You know, you can talk about, well, how could you have done it this way? Could you have done it that way? Um, rather than having to fix it. Everyone wants to make a good impression on other people. Listen, it's normal. We dress nicely, whatever. Um, however, if you worry too much about always having to look good to other people, it sends your child the wrong message. Now listen, some people, it's very hard for them in public to not, to show their dirty laundry. I don't mean walk around and like, you know, talk about your deep depression all the time. But, be honest if you're having a hard time as a parent. Be honest that it's, it doesn't always cooperate. Because, first of all, this is the most thing you can do to another parent. The best thing you can do in your community of parents, and I know you want to be a good community, is to show other parents you've been there. You also have a hard time. Because frankly, you're all having a hard time. I don't care what someone looks like, you cannot tell a book by its cover. A family can look as put together as anything. Trust me, they're having difficulty, and I know this. Well, because, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, and when they come and tell me about it, I know it. So, but you should be sharing this more with each other. Parenting is supposed to be done in a community. And the best way to be a good community is to share. And when you try to be too, have it all together, you know what message it sends to your child? You should be ashamed of how you are. And you don't want your child to feel ashamed. But if your child doesn't feel that it's okay to be themselves and for you to be yourself, the message is, I'm not okay. It's not a good message. Okay, I'm gonna end, I think. I'm gonna end with this. It's a competitive world out there. And yes, it's going to encourage your children to compete. But not everybody can be the best. Think about it, the best is only one person can be the best. And the more your child grows up, they can be the best in math in fourth grade. But every child, even those who go to Harvard, discovers someone else is smarter, prettier, thinner, more achieved, has more successes than they do. So we cannot depend on the need to be the best. We have to depend on the need to try to achieve our best and recognize that, you know, it doesn't matter so much to be the best. We just have to be the best we can be. Anyhow, I'm going to end there. Thank you.